Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here alongside our esteemed panel to hear their insights on how we can meet the infrastructure challenge to become a stronger, more resilient, and sustainable infrastructure sector. This morning, we've heard from the government on the context and the vision for what they have articulated is how we will partner to address the challenges ahead of us, to rebuild a sector that benefits all New Zealanders. We've also heard from the Infrastructure Commission on their approach to listen and seek input to build out the 30-year infrastructure strategy for how we will deliver a sustainable infrastructure sector that what should a uh, sustainable sector look like for our te aroa. Clearly, we know that sector is not without its challenges, and that is why we have the panel here today. Long-standing and exacerbated by COVID-19 are the challenges that we see across the workforce. We know there are skills gaps. How do we get the right skills in the right places at the right times? We also know that we need to maintain health and safety for our workforce so that we are delivering with the safety in mind for our people and how we deliver our programs. Driving positive and sustained change in the culture and the behaviours across the sector that's been shadowed by a reputation of underpricing and competition. So how do we make the shift, especially in times of post-COVID recovery, towards one of collaboration, transparency, appropriate risk sharing and management? Having been part of the Accord program since it was signed between government and industry back in 2019, we know these challenges are not unique to New Zealand. However, we also know the sector must perform to deliver successfully for our communities, our whānau, our workforce, our businesses, as well as our regions. I'm thrilled to have the panel that we have today that are facing these tough questions every day. The panel's members are their leaders in their own right and bring diverse perspectives across the infrastructure spectrum to share their views on the challenges and offer some insights and ideas on how we can drive the change that is much needed. We'll start off hearing from each panel member to give their insights on some of the key infrastructure challenges that they see. And then we'll cover off some of the themes and to discuss what is it going to take to deliver the challenge successfully. Peter, let's start with you. You've seen the sector in New Zealand as well as overseas. What do you see are the challenges for us right now? Uh, kia ora, Judy. Um, I think uh, it, it, in our organisation at Fletcher, we talk about pride of place for generations to come. And, and if you think about that, what are the challenges in creating that? It's about people and places connecting. And I think the challenges around connecting, and I know we've discussed it, the construction accord is, is certainly, you know, we, we tend to think about projects, not programmes in New Zealand, so we tend to price and, and we put risk in and we uh, look at a project as if it's your last project. And I think thinking more about a larger program and some agencies are doing that now, it's fantastic, but that's a key challenge. Capability and capacity, um, for all of us, it's, it's a significant challenge of the skill sets coming through, particularly diverse skill sets and diversity, I think is a challenge uh, in the sector, thinking about what skill sets do we need in the future, but doing something about it now. So skills, capability, um, and thinking about larger programs of work would be key challenges. Graham, do you have anything else to add on that? Thanks, Judy. Yeah, kia ora koutou. Um, I think the immediate challenge uh, right now relates to the uncertain operating environment around COVID-19 and the, the impacts that are likely to ripple for another uh, 12 months or beyond that at least. So it kind of feels that the point that we're at now is maybe the first quarter of this game or maybe oranges at half time, um, but we've still got uh, a long way to go. So uh, immediately uncertainty. Um, beyond that, longer term, stability um, of pipeline and trust in that pipeline that it's going to be uh, delivered on time. And I think both Hamish Glenn and, and Ross spoke about that uh, previously, taking a more strategic approach. Uh, that's an enduring challenge. Uh, the resources, skills and capabilities, as Pete, Peter mentioned, to, um, to give effect to that pipeline uh, are going to be there as well as a challenge um, in the medium term. Steve, what are some of the issues that you think we really face over here? So we've talked about skills, we've talked about strategic approach. Anything else that you want to add to that? 
Yeah, Kira Tato. Um, yeah, I think, we, I think we need to get back to basics. Uh, I mean, we joined this sector with a view of providing infrastructure to help communities survive and thrive. And at the moment, we're facing a big deficit in infrastructure investment. Uh, and we're also facing the challenges of growth on top of that. So I think, uh, and Ross talked about it, going back to that strategy is key. Uh, and for me, the strategy has got to break down the silos. We tend to talk, even in transportation, about big roads, small roads, rail, light rail, uh, rather than talking about joined up infrastructure. Even the divide between social and economic infrastructure is unhelpful when planning society. Uh, because try delivering services if you haven't got a healthy, well-educated workforce. So I think that's key. Um, I think the other thing we could do with is more diversity of thought. Um, I'm, I'm trying to steer away from the diversity word because it's become rather corporate. Uh, I think what we need is the diversity of thought that comes from cultural, gender, uh, and indeed generational differences. And uh, I, I guess as a panel, we're a bit of an example of what our industry has become. Uh, which is quite narrow, similar age, similar backgrounds. And what we really need to embrace uh, as purchasers, as deliverers of infrastructure, is that difference in mindset that will bring the solutions for the next generation. On that point, and it's a great point indeed, how do we actually break down the barriers? Now, we talk about diversity, we talk about diversity as initiatives, um, but what we want to get to is around the outcomes as a diverse workforce to benefit uh, the organisation, the programmes and the sector. How do we drive for that? What are some of the things that we need to put in place to enable that to happen? Uh, well, if I kick off on that point, um, I think it's break the cycle. Um, I occasionally come across colleagues and peers who say we should treat groups differently. But if you never break the cycle, you never get a change. Uh, and for me uh, and, and the business I'm responsible for, we're tackling that in two ways. A, changing the nature of leadership. Uh, so for example, we run to Arafanaki, which is about getting our Māori leaders uh, up in the business. So taking the 24% of the workforce they represent, but getting that same representation at the leadership levels. Uh, likewise, we've um, adapted that program to cover a Wahini program, and we're putting women in leadership at Downer. Uh, so I think that's really exciting. It's been running for seven years, and now we have two Māori on our leadership team. So a positive change in leadership. I think also in terms of school engagement, entry level, uh, actually getting the balance right. So I, I was delighted to see not only a, a great cultural mix in our interns this year, but 50% balance, male and female. So I think we have to break the cycle. We have to do things differently. Uh, and once we've made the change, then we can reintegrate. Uh, but you've got to do something to stir the change. A little bit like in our project world, most of our clients would only prefer to work with project directors that they know and have known for 20 years. But it doesn't widen the gene pool and it doesn't generate the change in thinking that we need and are looking for. Thank you. And Peter, having worked with you over the last year and a half, I know you're a strong supporter and advocator for diversity across programs, right from the project level through to the governance table. What are some offer of insights that you have around this area? Uh, I should agree with Steve. I think, you know, you have to force an intervention. Um, because quite often in our sector, people will recruit themselves. Um, and I certainly have seen great examples where, look, but like Steve, in our organisation, our recent intake of 40, 50 graduates was 50 50, and we forced that. And we did force that. Uh, we did put some targets down saying we have to, we have to force that. Um, I think what, what I'm seeing right now, particularly with the border closures and, and where we're at, I think it's a prime opportunity that we just have to try different stuff. So putting people into roles who may not have all the skills, but giving them a go. And you know, we're certainly, certainly trying to do that. I think it's learning across the sector. So I know as a sector, particularly on the construction of court, and I know across the key players, we are talking about this talent development, diversity, how do we do things differently? Um, and I think where we see great learnings and opportunities with Māori, Pacifica, young graduates, talent, um, we should adopt that. 
The one thing we're looking at is thinking about the skills going forward. I mean, when you do a commercial building now, you build it virtually. So where are the data analysts? You know, where are the, you know, how are you managing data? Yes, you need the engineers and the QS people, but it's different skill sets going forward. And I think as an industry, thinking harder about what's happening globally and doing something different about it with the universities, with AUT, who we're working with, I think will be important. So I have to acknowledge the fact that this sector has changed in profile over the last 10 years. Whilst it is a marginal change, we've seen greater participation of women and Māori and Pacifica across the construction and infrastructure sector. We've also seen this year across the Diversity Works Awards, five finalists represented across the construction sector. Um, in terms of trying something new and trying something different, Graham, what are your thoughts around that? I think... Um to extend the, the points from Steve and Peter before, uh, the interventions and breaking the cycle are about leadership. So we, you do have to get your hands around the issue and, uh, and forge ahead. Um, I think what I've heard uh, from both of my colleagues here is, uh, is reflected in the organisation that we lead as well. So it's addressing the issues, what are the barriers to entry that maybe are blockages to the, attract people towards the sector. Once you understand that, you can get into the detail of correcting it. Um, certainly hunting for bias, whether conscious or unconscious, and, and uh, as a leader, you know, being very clear about the behaviours that you expect with uh, recruitment and onboarding of staff, and then making sure that you have programmes in place that actually allow the experience to live up to the hype. Um, that's probably the, actually the first thing to get right, to make sure that you have appropriate support um, and mechanisms uh, in place before you attract people to the sector. Thank you, great reflections on that. I think going back to the, the broader point around skills and workforce generally, now we know that the sector is facing and has faced for a long time skill shortages across the different profiles and across different professions. What are some of the things that industry really need to tackle to really drive and attract more people into this workforce? Well, <clears throat> The, you know, the, the construction accord that was set up, which is a partnership between government and, and the sector, that we looked at seven challenges, and you know, Graham, Steve, and others were involved in that, and the first thing we came up with was behaviour. And so we came out with some principles around behaviour and what behaviours do we need as leaders and across the sector to connect, because people won't join the sector if, if there's behaviours that aren't supporting growth and development. Um, and, you know, and I think one good example is, you know, I would support, you know, people working across a number of our industries and coming back again, growing that skill set here, because if we don't, we could lose them offshore. So I think, I think we have to make the industries attractive and investing, but also showing that we're a connected sector. And there's a lot that's happened in the last year, and as a group, learning off each other, sharing ideas, making sure that talent is being able to grow and develop and being less siloed, as Steve said before. Connected ecosystem will make sure this industry thrives and grows and people will be attracted to it because it'll be, hey, that's where I can grow my career uh, uh, across the sector. I think uh, from, my, from my side, it's a, uh, a reasonably tough gig traditionally, so the hours are long, it's physically and mentally demanding. Um, the difference between success and failure is often all too uh, slim. Um, it's a nomadic lifestyle, traditionally. And that, um, you know, there were some uh, comments from mates in construction made earlier about the difficulties faced by uh, our people at all sorts of levels in the industry and the sector, and that is a very real challenge. Uh, I think getting inside those issues, um, they, they, it's a fantastic industry to be in service of society and actually providing kind of the raw assets that allow people and communities to thrive. Um, but I'm not sure that society actually fully values it as it should at the moment. So personally, I'd like to see more incentives around uh, training to direct people towards a career in infrastructure. Um, I'd like to see that they can create a lifelong career in, infra in infrastructure and service of their community, um, which is rewarding for them. Uh, and I'd also like to see the acknowledgement for people that have, uh, that have served out a career in infrastructure um, so that they can enjoy a comfortable retirement. So we heard from the Prime Minister this morning in terms of some of the plans and, and already in action in terms of free trade training and apprenticeships. What are some of those other initiatives to make the sector more attractive? I think it goes to Graham's point. We have to create a sector that has the right culture. 
Uh, and it's, it's an intergenerational thing. What was acceptable to us coming through in our early career won't be acceptable to others. Uh, and the industry will change. It will become more technologically biased. Uh, and we will need an environment that uh, is conducive to people staying and developing their careers. Um, so I think first and foremost, it's the culture of the industry. And I, th I think where people can play a huge part is starting to look at procurement, starting to look at behaviors on site to reduce the combative nature uh, of the sector and then start to develop ideas and technology that take us forward. But um, yeah, if, if you want the highest talent available uh, that's out there, and I think construction truly needs it, uh, then you've got to start with that cultural environment. We also need to, and I know Steve, we've talked about this, we need to be a learning sector, because there are some significant things that were done in this country. You know, the Kokoda response won a global engineering award, and a global engineering award, just unbelievable. And the people that went through that, the skill sets and through our organizations, what they've learned and what they've developed. So as a sector, we've got to get stronger, and we've talked about it, and we're trying to do it through the sector accord, is take best practice. So what we call beacon awards, you know, what are some of the really good practices that we can stimulate and develop? And then that will attract talent, and that will grow people. Um, and I think as an industry, we're in a perfect position to do that. We're a lot more connected now than I think we might have been four or five years ago. Uh, and certainly the government's helped to, to try and bring us some of that together. So just in terms of, you all mentioned earlier in that broader pipeline, now we heard from the government around the, the volume of investment for infrastructure coming through. What are your thoughts in terms of what industry and government should be doing to provide a more coordinated approach in terms of pipeline delivery? I think the here and now, uh, it's, it's about having enough work in the market to allay people's fears about job security. We, we talk about trying to attract increased talent, we talk about the need for greater resource, but a lot of the sector come from a background of peaks and troughs in workload and job security is still front and center. So, so anyone that works in the large project space will know a year out people are worried about the next job. So I think that's first and foremost is let's, let's have enough work in the market to secure those jobs. I think then it becomes about the strategy which Ross talked about, we, we need that long-term view. And then if we've got that view, we can actually resource and plan accordingly. So actually look at our execution. Uh, rather than react suddenly to a workload or a peak in workload because that's A, inefficient, B, it gives people a job today but doesn't give them a career path for the future. So immediate stimulus followed by planning in the long term, followed by strategy execution, and then a considered view. Uh, one of the challenges you face when uh, you, you run a big um, construction orientated business is you know there's a lot of work there, but you can only deal with what you've secured and you can only plan around what you've secured. So, so again, it would be helpful to have work orders placed well in advance of delivery. That way we can plan our execution and level our workload in the same way that manufacturing does. I think the, uh, it was pleasing to hear uh, the Minister Grant Robertson talk about his focus on infrastructure and forming a team that will be there to focus on not, on, not only the financing of projects but the delivery of, uh, of the pipeline. Uh, over the longer term. So my, my call out for working with government would be to engage with industry, um, call on us. Uh, we're happy to share our advice uh, and views on different matters and that may um, create an, uh, an element of uh, collaboration at that level that, that sorts out some of the peak and trough activity that we typically see. Uh, clearly our traditional role is to compete vigorously at the latter stages of the process and we, we need to continue to do that. Um, but if government calls, then we're here to share our views and opinions to try and improve the situation overall. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, we're, we're a small country. The sector's only, between vertical and civil, 15 billion, right? And the, and the government is a big procure in that space. So particularly government, now Minister Roberts has got the opportunity with, with transport and health and, and water to connect a lot of the agencies. And, and what I'd like to see and the challenge I'd put out there is you know, as we're looking at doing roads in a region, what about 
what about the education? What about the other agencies? What are they investing? So we can invest in a region, not just a project. We've got to get out of a project silo because it'll force silo thinking. But if we get connectivity and agencies coming together, Key Rail, Waka Kotahi, um, education, and we're on the cusp of that, but I'd like to see government driving that, driving the wellbeing uh, budget pillars through procurement at the front end. We're still seeing too many contracts coming out with wrong risk allocation, and all you'll do is create silos. And I think this government's got the appetite and connecting it through leaders and sector, private sector government coming together is the way to go. But we just need to get the Bunsen burner on and, and focus on programs in a region and fund them properly. If you keep on going on singular focus on projects, we won't be any different in 10 years' time. So on that particular core data approach, thinking about beyond just the project, but the communities that's being served, you know, what does a good procurement process look like? What should it actually be in terms of what we want to see? I, I think the, uh, the first element we've touched on, which is a good procurement process, hangs off a good strategy. Uh, and as Peter's uh, alluded to, having a strategy that suits regions from both a land use um, and a development point of view is key. Um, I think then it's about transparency um, of timeframes, so being very clear on the timeframes, allowing adequate time to procure effectively. Uh, but also um, doing it in a way that's uh, not over multiple years. Uh, so basically m taking the pain out of selection so businesses can be very clear on their workload well in advance. I think uh, assuming that the problem has been defined and there's a project that's, uh, that's desired to be procured, uh, allowing enough time frame to engage with industry and test their thoughts on what an appropriate uh, methodology for procurement um, and also understanding elements of supply chain capability to actually give effect to its delivery. Uh, allowing enough time uh, for people to consider uh, in a competitive environment the very best offer that they can make and all too often we see condensed time frames in procurement after uh, decades of planning funding and investment uh, has gone by into a particular project, it seems like uh, we're giving up some value on the way through there. Uh, and I think a reasonable balance between value for money and also non-price attributes, a broader outcomes focus, uh, and making sure that you really know and understand the team and their capability that you're bringing on board to, to uh, do this work for you. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, the procurement front end is critical. It's, you know, someone said to me recently, when Abraham Lincoln said he had 10 hours to cut down the tree, you spend nine hours shutting in the X. So what are we doing about the nine hours shutting in the X with, with uh, early contractor involvement, design involvement, front end involvement, getting the right procurement methodology, constructability at the front end? You know, it's a crapshoot if you're just gonna put a tender out there and you're gonna try and aggressively attack it in six weeks. You'll have pain all through the process. So bringing people together more collectively, getting right thinking at the front end, not having 50 bespoke contracts in the market, you know, simplified contractual mechanism, fair risk allocation, that's all been laid out in the construction accord. We know it's the risk, it's the issues. And we've seen some agencies, particularly, you know, education do a fantastic job in simplified contracts at the front end. Got to do a lot more work there, and that'll make a massive difference in terms of the sector. And you know, people will join. It'll be a healthy, productive sector. Look, it sounds like all of your organisations, as well as yourselves as leaders in those organisations in the sector, are committing to doing something different for the change that we want to see. I want to put to each of you, in closing remarks, in terms of what is the most important thing for industry and government to commit to doing for a high-performing infrastructure sector? For me, it would be about that strategy. Uh, so let's have a strategy that aligns with society. Uh, let's work collaboratively. Uh, we've touched on procurement. I think we'd uh, unanimous, unanimously commit to the fact that where we have early involvement, where people are engaged at a personal level, we get better outcomes. Uh, Kaikoura being a really good recent example. So have a strategy, engage across uh, the elements of our sector and really allow the space for that thought leadership. Um, and I think we were, live in a world where everything's a rush. 
actually, if, if we can make sure there's enough workload to keep the job security there, we can afford to step back, think through the strategy, execute it well, and resource it appropriately with the right social outcomes in mind. Thoroughly support Steve's view there. Uh, strategy uh, to action to create a stable marketplace um, where you can understand and trust that the opportunities are going to translate to reality. Um, those are the fundamental conditions to be able to effectively direct capital investment and also investment in resources, skills, training, capability and people for the long term. So that's, that's the one we want to see. Yeah, look, we're, we're in agreement. I, there's some really good things happening. Uh, we, we are starting to get a better connected ecosystem, but from government infrastructure, if, if they can change some behaviours, it'll make a big impact on the sector. And we're already starting to see some great models, you know, through water care, kind of order, or education uh, department. We've got to celebrate those, and we've got to pursue those. And as Steve and Graham said, more involvement at the front end design, constructability, planning, that'll make a big difference. And I think government have a great opportunity on infrastructure because they're a large player through lo either local, central government, forcing some models that'll bring the industry together. And then stand back and let, let the private sector have a go and collaboratively work. You know, come up with some different ideas. Um, that will make a big difference. And I think, I think we're on the cusp of that. Great, thank you. Look, I really appreciate your candid and considered comments this morning. Um, just on that note, there's the question that I posed to the panel members. I ask and invite you all to take part in the next two days to think about what is the one thing that you will commit to doing as a sector or representative for government um, in terms of driving the change that we want to see to rebuild for the nation in terms of a high-performing construction infrastructure sector. Now, it just so happens that a high-performing construction sector is the vision of the Construction Sector Accord program, uh, and we invite you to join us and come talk to us in the Accord booth to hear about what it's this about, as well as what is the change that we want to work together, together and collaborate to deliver on. Um, I think one of the quotes that stood out to me and uh, we definitely drive by in the Accord program is that we want to be the change that we want to see. We are in this together. He waka e kanoa. Tēnā awa atu koe, Peter, Graham and Steve. Tēnā awa atu koutou. Thank you all. Thanks, Judy. Kia ora, Judy. Thanks, Judy.